Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Independence Day weekend. Yep, it's Saturday, July 2nd. And we are going to re-air an interview that we did some time ago. This was in the before times, well before COVID ever hit. Um, We are going to re-air an interview with Ken Langone over the next couple of days. Um, He had just written a book uh, called I Love Capitalism, an American Story. So we thought it would be kind of a fun thing to re-air this from a guy who kind of embodies the American dream and the American success story. So here's the first part of our interview with Ken Langone. You were born to uh, Italian-American parents on the North Shore of Long Island. Yep. They, who's first generation, your grandparents or your parents? My parents are first generation. Your parents are first generation. Working class. Dad yeah, was a plumber? My father was a plumber. He went to the eighth grade. Yep. My mother worked in a school cafeteria. She went to the seventh grade. And you lived on what you so, sort of describe as like the bad side of the tracks well, in was, a nice it town. Where, it was where the poor people lived. Yeah. You know, we had a, I think my parents paid $4,000 for the house they bought, which they couldn't buy. And they were living, renting the house for a few years. It was, it was uh, right by the public school. How is it that your parents, who were not educated, were so encouraging that you become educated? Because a lot of people who grew up as tradespeople, children of tradespeople, mm-hmm. go into the trade. My father made me learn to be a plumber. On weekends in high school, I used to help him. So I could do all the things a plumber does, wipe a joint, hit a, hit a joint for copper tubing with lead, uh, thread a pipe, cut pipe, all this, this stuff. This is great because I need some work on my uh, well, Go my to Home apartment. Depot. We've got oh. a lot of people <laughs> that can really help you. And we've got great prices and everything you need, okay? Okay, so you learn, you learn the trade, but, but what was it that they knew about being educated? My parents... God bless them, didn't blame themselves for where they were. They felt if they had the chance for an education, they'd have done better than they did. And we used to go to my grandparents in Port Washington for lunch every Sunday. This They all got together. We would drive through a wealthy section of town called Roslyn Estates. And when we would drive through there, every time we'd drive through there, Mom would say to me, I was sitting in the back of the panel truck. She was sitting in the front on a, on a makeshift chair seat. And she'd say, would you like to live here someday? And I said, yes. She said, well, you're going to have to work hard and get an education. So she okay. knew. Okay. Well, they understood because they knew they could be capable of doing so much more, but they lacked the tickets. And meanwhile, you they're telling you be educated, and you say you weren't such a great student. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, I... <laughs> I wanted to make money. I hear you. You say it in like very plain English Wait, right here on page six. I loved making money. Yeah, I was, hell, I, 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 I delivered newspapers. I was a caddy. I worked in a gas station. I worked in a butcher shop. I used to take the cardboard out from the liquor store. There was a supermarket in Rosalind called M&H that opened up. At the same time, I was working for the butcher shop, which was a competitor. At nights, I was helping them set up the store without the butcher shop knowing I was working two jobs. I mean, it's interesting. You say, I was never academically curious, and I didn't apply myself at all. So, but you did say math came easy to you, so that oh, was, was good. Numbers were just like that. Tell me about how you then headed to Bucknell University. How'd you get there? Understand that, that I did okay in high school. Numbers and me got along very well, and I still do. Mm-hmm. I had pretty much convinced myself that I wasn't a student. And I wanted to go into the Marine Corps in 1953 because the Korean War was still on. Mm-hmm. My brother was in the Army, my older brother. I only had one brother. And I took the position that this is what I wanted to do. Well, Eisenhower had different plans at the end of the war. Mm-hmm. So I said, what am I going to do? And I went to see friends of mine from Port Washington, Jim McNamara, J.R. Davis, Stan Cutler. They were at Bucknell. Uh, I went there, and it was house party weekend. And I said, Jesus, this is what you do in college. <laughs> I could do this really well. Well, this fits me. I, yes, I can execute so on this. So they had Saturday morning classes, and that morning, that Saturday morning, they said, look, we have to go to class. Why don't you go over and see the guy over in the building over there? He's the guy that lets people in. It was called the registrar. His name was George Faint. And I went over, and I, he said, I'm sitting there, and he says, what are you waiting for? I said, well, my friend said I should come see you. What about it? I said, well, I'm in high school. Are you a senior? I said, yeah, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. He said, well, come on in my office. So we talked for an hour. The following Thursday, I get a letter from him that if I want to come to Bucknell, he'd be happy to have me. That may be the best decision that anyone from Bucknell ever made. No, the best decision anybody from Bucknell ever made, Yeah, and it's in the book, was my economics professor, 
who wanted to know if anybody ever told me I was stupid. And I said, yes, everybody. And he said to me, you know the only sin? You believed it. And That's he great said, advice. And he said to me, how are you doing in your other classes? I said, about as bad as I'm doing in your class. He said, well, you know you're going to be out of here in January. I said, yeah, I know that. And he said to me, is that what you want to happen? I said, no, I don't. He's okay. He said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll reach out to all your other professors. You promise me you'll work, give it everything you got, and we'll see if we can pull you out of this nosedive. And they did. It's something interesting to me that many people will say the difference between someone making it and not making it, whether, and you're, I know you're involved in the charter school movement, right. it can be anyone from a coach, a music teacher, an academic mm-hmm. teacher who just says, hey, you, you, Ken, what's going on here? And they see something in you. Yeah, I, look, every place I look, I see people that I know have helped me to do what I've done. And in many cases, have done more than I've done myself. And that is why you say you are not a self-made man. I am man. the furthest thing from a self-made man you'll ever know. Okay? And I, I, my regret on that, I'm not regret, I hope I didn't, I, this, I don't know how many hundreds of names there are in there, but I hope I didn't leave anybody out. But if I did, it was a bad memory. Yeah. Not that they didn't participate. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how you left college and you uh, said you're going to go, you know, it's like uh, where the bank robber goes, he's going to go to the bank. Uh, that's where the money is. Right. You said the money's in Wall Street. So yeah. you graduate and you go talk to some folks. I do love this advice uh, from uh, Maurice Hart. And he says, quote, let me tell you the lay of the land. We have Jewish firms for Jewish kids. We have WASP firms for WASP kids. The Irish, we make the clerks. We put them on the floor of the stock exchange. Italian kids like you, we put in the back office. What did you think when you heard that? Uh, I didn't appreciate the fact that he was discrimination. But I know one thing. I made my mind up. That ain't going to hold me back. You have no idea the price we're paying for our entitlement system in America. Not the money, but the number of people that don't get a chance to develop self-respect by doing it for themselves. You've got to respect yourself first before you're going to respect anybody else. Somebody who has no respect for themselves has a difficult time seeing good in somebody else. I, I view that more as an opportunity than as a setback. So I want to talk a little bit about how you did get into Wall Street selling securities, Mm -hmm. and that was in the early 60s, and and talk a little bit about what you did and how you then ultimately met Ross Perot. Okay. I was called back, I was in the Army once in in 58 for six months, and then I got called back when they built a wall around Berlin in 61. When I got out in June of 62, I made my, Wall Street had had the biggest crash that it had, had since 1929 in May, and everybody was leaving Wall Street, and I said, hey, this is my moment to strike. And my father-in-law, God bless him, he was in the business, and he set me up with a series of appointments, and the fact that people were leaving and the firms were cutting back, I kept going, and I, I really was getting discouraged, but I wasn't going to give up. I had a wife and one child and a second one due in September of that year. And I met a man, and he said to me, I'd like to hire you. His name was Jack Cullen. He said, I'd like to hire you. But he said, we're cutting back, and we just can't do it. And I said, but he said, I think you're going to be a big success. He said, I think you got certain talent. I said, what's that? He said, well, you strike me as a very sensitive guy, and that's a great, great talent to have hmm. if you're going to sell. So he thanked me and said he couldn't help me. And I got in the elevator, and I went down to the floor, down to the lobby and I thought to myself I said wait a minute I went right back upstairs and I said I'd like to see Mr. Cullen again and I went in and he said what's up did you forget something I said no I said let me ask you a question what do you pay a secretary he said we pay him about 150 bucks a week I said can you pay me as a secretary he said what do you mean I said can you pay me 150 a week he said well you can't make it on that I said no that's my problem I was teaching at NYU at night Mm. by the way consider this barely Ten years from when I was told I was going to get thrown out of college, I'm now teaching at one of the great business programs in the country. And so I said, I'll make it. Don't worry about it. So then I said, but there's only one condition. You have to give me every account you're not doing business with. And boy, then I went to work. That's great. And so you were selling. Selling like crazy. And you are a salesman at heart. I love selling. Even if you love the numbers, the selling, you're a relationship guy. That's the sensitivity that he saw. It's all about the people. Absolutely. And that includes companies. Mm -hmm. Great companies are run by great people. Home Depot is a success it is because we had people like Bernie and Arthur and Pat 
These were our partners when we started the company. Mm-hmm. All right, and these men were unique and special in every respect. All right, let's get back to Ross Perez. Right. How'd you meet him? I went to a party in Washington in uh, in 1968, and I met a man there who said he was Perot's partner and Washington representative. Now, I didn't know who the hell Perot was. I didn't know what he did, and he started telling me, and I said, "Gee, that sounds like that's interesting." And he said to me, I said, gee, I said, is there a chance I can get in to meet this man? He says, well, call me on Monday. I'll see what I can do. The name was Jack Height. I called Jack on Monday. He said, look, you got an appointment. He said two things. You got 30 minutes. And he said, don't use any bad words. So I said. And you're oh, a little rough on the on the bad words. So. I am what I am. I know. Me too. Okay. Can't do it here. But it is yeah, what it is. I understand. You know, if you live in a trading room long enough, that becomes, That's part, exactly. of, that becomes part of the territory. Mm-hmm. So anyway. I went down and I met with him and exactly at the point I was supposed to get in, I got into his office and we were 30 minutes and for 29 and a half minutes, he told me everything he'd heard from Goldman Sachs, Whitewell, Merrill Lynch, Clark Dodge, GH, all these firms that were really trying to get his deal. And when he got all done, it was about 30 seconds left. And he said to me, what do you think of what I just said? And I think, well, I blew the 30 minute rule, right? Right. So I said, Mr. Perot, I said, pardon me, that's the biggest pile of horse shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that's awesome. And he looked back, he took back, and he said, what do you mean? And we talked for 13 hours. We talked till 1 o'clock the next morning. Good God. I had not brought any clothes down, so he was driving us around Dallas looking for a drugstore where I could buy some toiletries and a T-shirt. Oh, my God. And we found out in that meeting we were married the same hour, the same day, the same year. His values and his integrity was so precious. And I, I said to him, I said, I'll never throw a curve at you. And he said, oh, he said I was going to make a decision by Friday. This was Wednesday. He says, I'm going to put it off. He said, let's get to know each other better. So over three months, uh, he played with my head a couple of times. One time he called me and said, you know, he said, Ken... The thing that bothers me about you is you don't show your enthusiasm very well. I said, what? I'll be yeah. down there in five yeah, minutes. Right. You think that this thing, which is basically builds like the electronic infrastructure for big municipalities. No, what they did was they ran data processing operations. They were called out. They weren't called outsourcing them, but that's what they were. They would send their highly trained, capable programmers and scientists into these companies and help them get the most they could get out of their computers. It's amazing. So you then become the guy who runs the firm where the where they Well, say- I, I got that deal. I'd been made a partner before that. I was made a partner in 66. I got that deal and I felt pretty good about my, I was kind of full of myself, frankly. <laughs> you know, I think today I might be less arrogant than I was then, but I was floating around. I got this deal from all these other firms and I did it and blah, blah, blah. By the way, I didn't do it alone. Again, Mm -hmm. we had a team of people at Pressbridge that were fabulous. And when I gave this big number to Pro, 100 times earnings was an unheard of multiple. Yeah, and you got more than that. He got 115. He thought when he asked me driving through the tunnel to sign the papers in Jersey, he said, well, this is what you're going to tell me. I'm not getting 100. I said, you're right. And he got a little perplexed. And his wife, Margo, was in the car with me and we're in the back seat of a limousine, two seats looking at each other. And I said, yeah, you're not going to get 100 times earnings. He said, see, Morgan, we're all alike up here, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, look, if you want 100, that's okay with me. So then Morgan said, well, what were you going to do with it? I said, well, I was going to do it at 115 times earnings, but if you only want 100. Yeah, that's fine. We did it at 115 times earnings, by the way. It was a good do, as we say. It was, and by the way, I think of that company with enormous respect. They had, they had the most wonderful people in the company. They were motivated. They were high class. They were very professional. Lots of military people in that company. Bunches of, don't forget, this is is kids coming out of Vietnam. We had, and he had these kids and he gave them opportunities. Mm -hmm. He gave them awesome responsibilities and the ability to make decisions. And if they made bad decisions, it wasn't the end of their career. Okay, if you enjoyed that, wait for tomorrow. We get part two of Ken Langone. And if you've got a financial question, we may not answer it immediately this weekend because we're both probably away and doing fun stuff. I hope you are too. Uh, But we will get it as soon as we return. Go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button, and we'll get you on the air. Mark does everything. He's so smart and great and easy. Okay, so do that. Okay, why don't you lift someone up today and maybe that lift up is uh, leaving us a rating or review. We sure would appreciate it. Grit, growth, grace. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow. 